Hi everyone. Welcome to our STEM Women Hangout on Air. And this is the first of many that we plan to have. My name is Budini Samarasimha. I'm a molecular biologist. Joining me is my co-host, Zuleika. Hi, Zuleika. Hi. Do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. So my name is Zuleika Zavalos. I'm a sociologist. And our guest today is Professor Jonathan Eisen. Jonathan, can you tell us a bit about yourself and what you do? Yeah, I'm a professor at UC Davis, and I study evolutionary biology of microbes and microbial diversity, and I'm also heavily involved in science communication issues and now uh, women in science related issues. And for those of you who might not be familiar, Jonathan is also a big open access advocate as well. Yeah, I'm wearing my PLOS shirt. <laughs> nice. So one thing that made us choose you as a guest is because you've been very passionate and vocal about supporting women in STEM. When did this interest start? What made you get into this? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I probably have been interested in it indirectly for many, many years. My mom is a chemistry professor and okay. has been involved in AWIS, American Women in Science activities, so I hear about them in the background. Um, but in terms of actually doing anything about it, it wasn't until maybe four or five years ago when I started to complain vocally about the limited representation of women at science conferences that I participate in. And that led to me getting more interested in the issue generally. OK. So did you, apart from your mum, did you have any other um, female role models growing up that's influenced your interest in STEM in women? Um, well, my family is like the science geek collection. Um, so uh, my mom, being a physical chemist, was one of the female models. But my dad was a molecular biology researcher, and um, my grandfather was a physicist, and aunts and uncles are doctors who do a little bit of research and there's just a lot of science in the family so I mean there's definitely that side of things. As a kid for reasons that I couldn't explain to you every year I wrote when I had to write term papers for school they were always about Marie Curie. Um, okay. So I guess she was a role model. <laughs> and yeah I, I guess it's very cool that not only do you come from a family of scientists, but the women were also scientists as well. It wasn't just all the males in your family were science background. Yeah, I mean, it just it never it never really came up that there should be a distinction. I guess. Yeah. So when did you have that rude awakening that that's not the case everywhere else? You know, I I again, I'm not sure exactly when I. You know, I'm sure I saw little things here and there all along the way. I've been involved in science and science research since I was an undergraduate and then worked uh, yeah. for a year in a lab and then graduate school. And there's always, you know, some subtle undercurrent of things in various locations. But you're busy as a student and a yeah. graduate student. And when you start doing um, your research, I think... Probably when I had my first real job after graduate school, I worked at a genome research institute. And genomics and bioinformatics is pretty heavy on the male collection of yeah. prominent people. Uh -huh. And it also has an unfortunate bit of, you know, sort of male, you know, testosterone laden um, self promotion activities. Uh, so, so I think I probably noticed it then, but again, didn't do much about it until I was at UC Davis and just got furious at conferences I saw that would have very few women speakers in fields that had a lot of women in them. Okay. And that actually brings us up to one of the questions I wanted to ask you. A few days ago, you tweeted this awesome picture about female conference speaker bingo. I actually shared it out through our event page, so anyone 
who's watching can go to our Google Plus event page and see this image. But I'll also screen share it so everyone else can see it. And Zuleika, if you switch the camera to me, you should be able to see it. Ah, screen share is not working. Zuleika, are you OK to screen share? Because my thing is not working for some reason. Uh, I can do. Sorry. <laughs> we did test this once before, but yeah. But I, I have it open here. I can read out some of the stuff while Zuleika gets it up. So it, it's one of the, it's the many excuses that we hear about why women are such a rare breed when it comes to conference speakers. Um, women just aren't interested in this field. Um, it's a male-dominated field. All the women are probably busy. Women never volunteer to present. No one has complained about this before. Uh, we're only responding to demand. Women are shy. So how many of these are, have you experienced? How many of these have you heard? Um, you hear all of them and um, many more excuses when I have um, publicly criticized other people for the lack of female representation at some of their meetings. And some of them are, you know, completely reasonable explanations for why it's hard in some cases to get a diverse collection of speakers for a conference. Yeah. But that, that doesn't mean that those should be the end of your yeah. attempts to try and have a diverse representation. Yeah. I, I guess you have almost an obligation to try harder. So if, you know, the first woman you reach out to says no, you, you shouldn't just be like, oh, well, I tried. Let's, let's move on. You should ask her to recommend other people and things like that. Yeah, I mean, I can I can give you an example of something that you might not think of when you're planning a meeting, where it would affect the probability that certain people would come, which is childcare. So okay. um, I was at a conference in the UCLA Conference Center at a place called Lake Arrowhead many years ago, and um, as I frequently do at meetings. I couldn't sit in all the talks for the entire time and I went outside and there was a woman playing with a little two-year-old or one-year-old kid and mm -hmm. I went up and asked her, you know, is she here for the conference? Is she skipping the meeting? And she said, no, she's there because she's the hired nanny for the conference for a graduate student. And okay. the University of Wisconsin had a program to pay for nannies to go to conferences with graduate students who had kids oh, in wow. order to help them travel to a conference. Yeah. And I found out this was a program started by Joe Handelsman, okay. um, who is a very well-known person now in the field of studying biases against women in science. Right, And um, she is one of my inspirations and role models in this. And I was blown away by the vision behind this. That, yeah. you know, it's not sufficient to just invite people to a meeting. Yeah. You have to think about why they might either not want to or not be able to come. Yeah. So is that something you feel that, you know, it, it would be good if conference organizers did that? Because... The example you cited, it was the university that was doing it for their grad students. Would it be a good thing if the conference organizers were also able to make that kind of arrangement? Yeah, I mean, I think that, again, you could probably come up with 10 to 15 low-hanging fruit issues that would make it easier for people of diverse backgrounds to participate either as a speaker or as an attendee at a conference. And, and this is clearly one of them. Now, yeah. you know, people can say, well, we don't have the money, right? We don't have the money to do this. Um, and you can always make that excuse. But if I'm organizing a conference, I want the conference to be interesting and have diverse perspectives. And if you're going to spend money on an open bar instead of, <laughs> instead of you know, child care for graduate students, I think that you should rethink what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. So, Jonathan, um, we've got a question from Jessica Kirkpatrick, who's lis listening to us on our um, Google Plus, 
And she asks, how do you respond to people who deny that sexism exists in STEM and think that by talking about this issue, we're co actually causing less women to want to be in STEM? Yeah, I'll, um, <laughs> I'll address the second part first, which is there, there's no doubt that occasionally when um, something is not going well or there are biases or challenges that talking about it can make some people feel worse about the issue than better about the issue. So I, I, I'm not sure I have a perfect solution to, to that part of the problem, but I don't think we can solve problems without being public about them and discussing them. And I think it's pretty clear, going to the first part of the question, it's pretty clear from scientific studies of um, STEM field, scientific studies of tenure and promotion activities, scientific studies of hiring, scientific studies of peer review in papers and grants. Um, there have been, you know, dozens to hundreds of actual careful research studies that have documented that there really is bias. If you take a CV and you send it to people and you put a male's name on the CV or a female's name on the CV, they are responded to differently. Um, yeah. So there, there are pretty clear issues we need to solve or be aware of. And implicit bias is this, you know, when, when there is bias that you don't really know about it or you're not doing it on purpose, per se. It's not, you know, blatant sexism. But it's pretty pervasive. And there's clear sexism. I mean, there's clear examples of cases where people behaved inappropriately in reviewing and treating um, all sorts of people, and certainly women yeah. is one of the groups where there's lots of documentation for that. Yeah. It's interesting. We see quite a, we've got another community that we help run science on Google Plus, and whenever we have uh, posts about research that's done on this, so we've yeah. got scientific evidence, and people still want to argue against it. Yeah, you know, saying that there's biases in the methodology, but that there's been hundreds of studies, as you say. So it's interesting that people try and refute the science on sexism using science or flawed science, yeah. rather. Yeah, yeah. and well, actually Jessica, who just asked that question, is someone who often she posts a lot in our community about this issue. Every time we have to deal with trolls on her posts saying, "No, why are you talking about this? This is not true." And that's actually something that Zuleika and I and the other two women of the STEM women community are trying to do. Let, let's move this conversation beyond what, beyond that arguing, is sexism there or not? Let's talk about what we can do about it instead of just being fixated on arguing, is it there, is it not? Yeah, I mean, I can, so in part because I started writing about this conference issue, I got more interested in the broader issues that you refer to, and I'm now um, involved in a UC Davis project as part of this NSF Advance program. So the National Science Foundation has a whole program called Advance that is okay. focused on um, improving the hiring, retention, promotion, and you know life of women and underrepresented minorities in STEM fields. Okay. And they launched this program because of the scientific evidence that there were problems. And they've documented this extensively. If you Google, you see, uh, Google NSF Advance, um, you can find the NSF page that describes all sorts of scientific studies about um, bias in STEM fields at the faculty level. There are right. also well-documented cases at other levels. And so I, UC Davis has one of these grants. And I am okay. now involved in the project and what we're trying to do is um, change the policies and practices within UC Davis of things like hiring committees okay. and tenure and promotion committees and policies related to leave and policies related to you know time off um, for other reasons uh, because it's very clear that we are not getting the best scientists in the world yes. um, at our institutions because we lose many of them or we don't hire them because there's bias. 
And if we yeah. want science to be the best, if we want the field to be, you know, cutting edge and doing new interesting things, why would we basically abandon half of the potential population? Yeah, it's just that's dumb. a very good point. Yeah, it's a very good point. It, yeah, I, I don't have anything to add to that. <laughs> And I'm I'm very I'm really sort of I'm very happy that uh, the institution that I am at is committed to trying to fix the parts of the institution that you know lead to women and underrepresented minorities either not being hired or not staying yeah. in STEM fields. Do you think it, it's something that should happen from the top, or is it something that women should be advocating for? Because I guess one of the things that most people are scared of, I mean, you know, this is something Zuleika and I have talked many times, feminism, being a feminist is almost a bad thing. And yeah. you know, no one wants to out themselves as feminists because, oh, you're one of those feminist people. And it, do people... Do you think people are scared to come out as feminists because they could suffer professionally from those things? And, you know, a way to circumvent that would be to have top-down initiatives. What do you think? No, I, th I think that um, there's no doubt that uh, people can get branded um, if they are overly vocal about um, issues that relate to whatever group they belong to. And um, one reason that we need men to be involved in this particular issue is that it's important for all of science, but we don't get branded in the same yes. way. Um, but at UC Davis, just as an example, the UC Davis Advance Grant, the head of our university, the chancellor of the university, is the PI on the grant. And she okay. comes to all the regular meetings about this program. She is deeply committed to top-down change at okay. the institution so that postdocs and junior faculty and people who are applying for jobs, they don't, they shouldn't have to make that part of their fight. Okay. It should be, it is in the interest of our institution to do this well because we will get better scientists and people will be happier staying here and they will be more productive. Yeah. Yeah. I mean I think you it, it doesn't hurt to have voices from all over. Yeah. Um, but it's critically important that the tenured faculty, that the deans and administrators and the government agencies and the foundations and the journals and um, the people with power who aren't taking big risks. Yeah. But they do something about it. Yeah. Th those who can afford to take those professional risks yeah. should do so. Yeah. That's a good point. I think, as I was saying a little bit earlier, you know, people think, people who already believe this think that maybe other people will speak up on it or they just take it for granted that, of course, women should be treated equally. But the issue is that, obviously, women aren't treated equally. So yeah. we do need people at every level of all different genders standing up and talking about this issue regularly and starting yeah. off from the position as Bedini was saying, the position we start off from is not is it there or is it not, but what are we going to do about it and what are the strategies? Yeah. Yeah, so I'll yeah. give you, I mean if you want to talk about what can you do about it, I'll give you a couple of examples of what not just UC Davis but the other advance projects around the country are doing. So a simple thing that they can do, for example, is I mean, again, the advanced program is focused on faculty level issues, but okay. diversity training for hiring committees, for okay. example, is yeah. actually a really useful thing. And you would, I mean, in this day and age, maybe you might expect people to have more sense in their heads, but you'd be amazed at how many examples there are of people women when they are interviewing for faculty jobs get asked about when they're planning to get pregnant and I mean it's just it's unbelievable how much yeah. um, idiocy there is in the behavior <laughs> of hiring committees yeah. and if you teach some of them about 
how this creates an unwelcome environment, yes. um, that can that can improve the situation. And another example is that um, in many fields, for a variety of reasons, um, women and in more so underrepresented minorities in the sciences, their focus of their research is a little different on average okay. than the focus of men or non-minority groups. Right. It's not that they're doing worse science, it's that their focus on average tends to be on things that are a little more applied um, and a little more sort of community related yeah. and, and they could be doing excellent work but if we hire and promote people based upon publication in a couple of journals that don't publish material from those fields yeah. or that don't publish applied work we're immediately biasing against excellent scientists who just happen to be more applied yeah. So, um, you know, the impact factor of journals, which I detest um, <laughs> and think is an idiotic metric, is not yeah. only causing problems with people generally in the sciences, but it actually has um, more negative effects against certain groups of people solely because they don't publish in those journals. That's a good point. That I never considered that impact factor can affect women more negatively than it would men. And these are just sort of simple examples that if you educate um, deans and administrators and tenure and promotion and hiring committees about the issues, you can actually, many of them don't want to have implicit bias in their behaviors but they might not have thought of some of these issues. Yeah. I mean, the person who asks when a woman is going to become pregnant should be fired, but that's, you know... Um, that goes with that thing. That's a separate issue. The, you know, the, the, there are plenty of people who accidentally yeah. create situations that are favor certain groups. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we have just under 10 minutes left and um, just a quick reminder for anyone who's joining us after we started. Um, this video will be available on YouTube for watching afterwards on our YouTube channel and you can also um, follow us on Twitter at STEM Women and we're also on the web at www.stemwomen.net. And you can join in on conversation on Twitter and Google Plus. And if there's any questions we couldn't answer during this hangout, we can always do it afterwards as well. I'll be on Twitter afterwards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Jonathan, you've talked about some of the really important organizational uh, strategies that we can start off with. What are some of the um, ways that you? What are some of the strategies that you use when you mentor your female students and um, junior colleagues that other people might be able to learn from? Yeah, I'm not sure I have a, a good um, general strategies. I mean, I think that um, the way we deal with these issues is different at every level. So, you know, there's an enormous amount of effort at not enough, but at the K through 12 level to try and, you know, inspire women or underrepresented minorities to be, um, to have more role models and to be more engaged in scientific activities. We see lots of, you know, bad issues related to that, but I think that, you know, there's at least an appreciation of, of how to do that. Um, I don't think there's, uh, I don't think there's enough focus on how to mentor graduate students or postdocs related to these issues. The, yeah. the advanced program that I'm involved in has a lot of activities that relate to junior faculty. We have a mentoring program that has been started that I'm involved in. We have a lot of activities that relate to um, junior faculty level. But um, I confess, I don't know of a lot of strategies or I, I don't have plans in my head for the best way to help out um, even the students in my own lab or postdocs. I mean, uh, I have um, 
you know, pointed them to a variety of resources. There's some good women in science postdoc, you know, resources out there. But uh, I need to learn more. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's something I've never experienced in my postdoc career. I've never um, had a conversation about this in a professional capacity with anyone about being what it's like to be a woman in science. It's all um, this extracurricular stuff I do on Google Plus and Twitter mm -hmm. where these, these topics get discussed. I would really like to see universities having these conversations as a normal part of graduate training, as postdoctoral training and things like that. The leaky pipeline phenomenon for those who aren't uh, familiar with it is how you know, at undergrad level, there's equal amounts of men and women in any STEM class. But as you go up the hierarchy, they leak out. And it would be good to have these people aware that these issues exist before they leak out. It's no good yeah. after they've already leaked out. Well, this relates to that original question um, from, I think it was Jessica Patrick, about, yeah. you know, does talking about it hurt in some sense and yeah. um, uh, I think that it, you know, like we, I just had this conference that I ran at UC Davis on the future of scholarly publishing and publisher perish and the issue came up with, yeah. you know, what should we tell graduate students about the future of science in general um, and some people were optimistic and some people were quite pessimistic um, <laughs> and, you know, I'm sure that the pessimism <laughs> scared off some people. Uh, but I think it's better to be honest about it and upfront so that people are prepared. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I think it also comes down to, you know, starting the conversation earlier as well. It's all well and good for us to be talking about this in specialized journals or um, it, it's good that we're talking about it now, but I think it, we shouldn't shy away from talking about it even at the undergraduate level. Um, one thing that Bedini and I talk about is that there's a difference between what happens in the social sciences because we, um, in, inequality is something central to sociology, for example. So there are issues with um, sexism, racism, and exclusion of minorities the further up you go in, um, at, at the faculty level, but at least we have a language to talk about it. And okay. it seems like in the natural sciences, this is a side issue that some people are talking about but it really needs to be something that's central to all the sciences. And, yeah. and I would just note that this is generally true about almost every aspect of life in at the natural sciences. I mean, people, they expect everything to be learned by osmosis. Um, and we, we don't, you know, people don't talk publicly about, you know, the tenure challenges and you yeah. know, a lot of issues that, you know, are somewhat independent and somewhat related to women and underrepresented minorities, but they're, we're just not very um, open or talkative about the issues outside of research issues. Yeah, and hopefully conversations like this can get that started. More people will feel comfortable about discussing these issues when they see people, prominent scientists such as yourself, discussing it openly. Maybe they can be less scared to come out and discuss these. Yeah, I mean, hopefully, and you know, there always are anonymous opportunities in some areas that may help yeah. some people talk about it when they don't feel comfortable doing it with their name yeah. attached to it. Yeah, and that's something that our website we're hoping to do. We're trying to get people to discuss their experiences in STEM, and we're trying to have this option of anonymous submissions if people want to discuss things without attaching their name to it that's another way to do, have that conversation. Yeah, I mean, it, it, um, it certainly can help and hurt, so it has to be done, you know, carefully. Yeah, agree. So I think we're off on the half an hour mark. So thank you very much for joining us. And there's a few questions we couldn't answer, but um, you can, if you can stick around and answer them either on the event page or on Twitter, that would be great. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, log on. I tried to ignore my feed while talking to you, so yeah. <laughs> I, will, I will log on now and look. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Right. Yeah. Bye. Thank you for joining us. Bye, everyone.
Thanks for joining.